This morning we run, not to a tomb, but away from it. Not to death, but to life. We run because we've seen the risen one. We run because we've witnessed your resurrection. We run because you are life, and your life is the light of all humankind, the light that shines the way to life. So we run toward the good news waiting around that corner, the astonishing miracle coming from that tomb where emptiness means victory and a dark space beats death, beats my death, which surely was around that corner had you not died for me, had you not risen for me. There at the empty tomb where Mary heard her name called and I hear my name too, I raise my hands in praise. Thank you, Lord for your great sacrifice. You have risen. Amen. you to lift your voices with us as we sing this morning. Come people of the risen King who delight to bring Him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, Oh 
of Christ Rejoice, 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 rejoice Let every tongue rejoice One heart, one voice Whole Church of Christ We're so glad you could be with us on this Easter resurrection morning and what a morning. We're drawing near to the end of our Easter journey but um, I trust that whatever your circumstances are you can be joyous this Easter. The empty tomb and cross, the risen Lord, we've got much to give God praise for in our service worship today. So let's pray together. After the graphically sad events of Good Friday, maybe it all looked hopeless. But we are here because this is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be glad and celebrate. Lord, you rose from the dead. You are our living Lord. So we come with our hymns of worship and our prayers of praise. And we come to give you the honour, the thanks and the glory that you alone deserve. We pray your resurrection power will transform not only our worship, but our lives too. In Jesus' name. Amen. And a reading from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said.
Look around. It doesn't take long to recognize the brokenness surrounding us. Division, hatred, fear, uncertainty. The pain we're witnessing is real. And the need for a savior is undeniable. It's this need which broke the heart of God and moved him to do the unimaginable. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to change our eternity, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Love on a cross, dying once for all, laid to rest in the darkness of a tomb. Today, as we face so many unknowns, may we remember the simple truth of Easter. The stone's been rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And love has risen. We're going to continue with our Easter prayers, but um, I know it's not always an easy time for some people, as Open Doors here reminds us. For Christians in nations like Afghanistan, Somalia and Libya, celebrating at all is a huge risk. They can face violent retribution from family, from the authorities or from militant Islamist groups. The most joyful day of the Christian calendar and they meet to celebrate at risk of their own lives. Then there's the risk of terrorist attacks on Easter Sunday, like the 2019 church bombings in Sri Lanka or the 2012 Nigerian attacks. However, many will be celebrating still, whether it's on their own or together in strict secrecy. Pray with me for Muslim-born converts around the world that they can find joy and consolation not just fear and isolation. Lord God, lover of the outsider and the outcast, we pray for those who've chosen to follow Christ at a huge cost to themselves. We ask you can help them stand firm in their faith as all around them mark Ramadan. Help them feel a true sense of belonging, belonging to you and your body on earth. Help them stay true to you, whatever that means for them. And we pray for all those who long to express and share their joy in the story of Easter. May they find a way safe and free of fear. Pray in the name of the resurrected Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace. Amen. Thanks there to Ben Corn from Open Doors. 
we continue in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a day to celebrate your victory. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand that our life doesn't end here, but that we have a great hope with you. Lord, this morning we pray for those who cannot celebrate this Easter because they've lost their beloved family member. Lord, we pray that they will be encouraged by knowing that one day they will see them because of our hope in Easter. Lord, bless all those people who cannot celebrate this Easter as we celebrate. Comfort them and remind them of the hope we have in you. We also thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you, Lord, for your victory. Thank you, Lord, for the hope you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to testify to the world that the empty tomb has given us the hope that one day we will see you face to face. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So, Father, we praise you that our faith is not in a good man who lived and died a long time ago. Nor do we trust in someone who left an example of greatness. We thank you our faith is in Jesus Christ, your risen Son. We thank you for the light of Jesus. We thank you for the love of Jesus and for the hope he gives us through his resurrection. He makes all things new. He is the source of comfort, forgiveness and peace for everyone. Lord, we praise you this Easter. And so in the words of the hymn, we sing the praise of Jesus as our ascending Lord, the triumph of our Saviour, of Christ, the Son of God. The forty days are over, earth sees his face no more, but Christ, the King of glory, we worship and adore. Amen. We may not know this hymn, but the words are good, so listen and reflect before we hear God's word from Bob. And it's the Village Chapel with Our Great God. Unchanging, mysterious and unknown Your boundless love unfailing In grace and mercy shown Bright seraphim and endless flight Around your glorious throne They raise their Day and night in praise to you alone. We sing Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah, glory be to our great Frail, helpless in 
Let every mountain, every field and valley of the Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. If you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20, and we begin reading, reading at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Our world needs hope. You know, in 1992, 30 years ago, a group of academics and historians compiled some startling information. Listen to this. Since the year 3600 BC, the world has known only 292 years of peace. During this period, there's been 14,351 wars, large and small, in which 3.64 billion people have been killed. The value of the property that has been destroyed is equal to the cost of a golden belt wrapped around the world 
97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. Since 650 BC, there's also been 1,656 arms races, and only 16 of these have not ended in war. The remainder ended in economic collapse of the countries involved. You know, it's extremely difficult when reading of the events leading up to the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ without becoming aware of the momentous events in which there is intense conflict. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul says that Christian believers struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And so, as we read the Gospel accounts, we become aware that we're in the presence of a, a great conflict between the forces of good and evil, the powers of light and darkness, and that this is very much a, a cosmic battle that is taking place between God and the devil. So let's consider for a moment the nature of that conflict. In reading modern literature in our sophisticated postmodern society, we become aware very abruptly that to speak of evil in terms of the devil or Satan, to some minds, just raises cries of disbelief at the naivety of such simplistic language. And on the other extreme, folks are saying, well, if that's what you want to believe, that's absolutely fine. But in God's economy, it's simply not good enough to sit on the fence in regard to the spiritual realm. You either acknowledge that it's there or you don't. And if you do, then one must make a choice as to whether or not our allegiance is to be for good or for evil. It's too easy to pretend that such things don't exist. And if there is a spiritual realm, then, well, it's for our good when we pass over to the other side. And that's not true. And certainly the Bible doesn't allow for that kind of thinking. I was reading this week of two young six-year-old boys who were struggling with the Sunday school teaching about the existence of the devil. And one boy said, oh, there's no devil. And the other one was a little bit upset and said, well, what do you mean? It's all through the Bible, said the teacher. Oh, that's not true, he said. You know, it's a bit like Santa Claus. The devil turns out to be your dad. One Christian writer puts it like this. The devil is not impersonal like stones or bureaucracies. He is a non-person. The devil has become all that God is not. He's not beyond personality, he's without it. His purpose in creation is not to destroy God. He, he knows he can't do that. He wants to draw us into the vortex of non-personhood that he has become and the nothingness of non-being that he is becoming. Satan, in short, aims to take as many of us with him as he can. Now, even as we read the words of Jesus up until his death, it's evident that he's engaged in a spiritual battle of which the cross is the finale of the, his victory over Satan and all the powers of darkness that seem to desire to hold on to us, even though for the most part we're unaware of its presence or influence. But be under no illusion. If you're a Christian, the enemy that we face daily in our spiritual lives is the same enemy who was defeated on the cross of Calvary. But for these folks in John's Gospel, this remained a mystery. Sure, the disciples had engaged with the demonic, and they'd seen incredible things that were obviously outside of the realms of their reality. And clearly in this passage, the Apostle John is selective in the incidents that he relates. And we can see that his intention is to highlight some of the spiritual lessons that came as a direct result of the resurrection and the great victory over Satan and sin and death and hell. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. On seeing the stone removed from the entrance, she ran to tell Peter and the other disciple, John we know it was, who ran to see, him, see for themselves. So if you want a first heading this morning, here it is. Surprise when you least expect it. In verse 10, we see that everyone went home except Mary. It would appear that this sudden rush of expectation that Jesus might be alive, after all, gave way to this overwhelming despair. Not only had the Lord been murdered, but now his body had been stolen. Why would anyone do that? Now, we know that the religious authorities have put a guard on the tomb initially to stop this very thing from happening. 
because Jesus said he would rise from the dead and they just wanted an end to him and of the movement of people that were following him. It was upsetting the status quo and the religious life just couldn't continue on as it was because Jesus' words were revolutionary and they were requiring the disciple to take the message outside of the place of worship. Mary was only interested in one thing and that was Jesus. Her emotions were in turmoil. She had nowhere to turn and there was an emptiness that left an ache in her heart that was so deep that all she could do was cry. Look at verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. The angels have no words of comfort or encouragement to offer Mary. Their function, it would seem, is to challenge her weeping. And in her desperation, she attempts to be logical as she turns to see who she assumes to be the gardener. Look at verse 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realise it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Now, thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. In uttering her name in the way that no one else could, could in a, a burst of love and relief and enthusiasm, Mary just throws herself at Jesus' feet and holds on to him. His response at first glance seems a, a little bit strange and maybe a little unexpected. Look at verse 17. He said, don't hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, clearly, Jesus is saying to Mary that things could never be as they were. But the fellowship she longed for, for, for would, would have to wait until he descended to the Father. This then was the great message to pass on to the disciples. But know something else here. For the first time, he calls them brothers. And that means belonging to one another, being in the same family. They're to share the same inheritance. What does he say to her? Go instead. Don't hang about here, Mary. Go and tell the others. Now, I want us to notice two things. First of all, after spending for the most part three years with Jesus, his followers still didn't get it exactly what was happening. Even after these close special times of fellowship, when he had those specific times to explain things carefully to them, he didn't get it. And secondly, now after he's been resurrected, Jesus, in what we believe to be the first contact with his followers, graciously, graciously commissions Mary, a woman, to tell the others the news. The disciples, of course, had suffered a bereavement. And this is perhaps one of the hardest emotions that we as human beings have to deal with. As believers, of course, we can cope that much better with the fact of death because we have the assurance in our hearts of heaven beyond this life. But physical loss is often, if, and not, if not always, devastating. The sense of desolation can be overwhelming. But Jesus proves in his life and in his death and his resurrection that he sees our pain and he offers answers and comfort. You know, I read a great story of a Persian king who was a really wise and good king. And he loved his people so much and he wanted to really know how they lived. So what he would do is get dressed up as a working man or a beggar and he would go into the homes of the poor. And no one who he visited knew who he was. And there was one time when he visited a man who lived in a cellar. And he sat with the man and ate the coarse food the man ate. And he spoke cheerfully to him, gave him kind words. And then he left. And sometimes later, sometime later, he went and visited that poor man again. And he disclosed his identity and explained, I am your king. Now, the king thought that the man would ask for a gift or for some kind of favour. But he didn't. Instead, he said this. You left your palace and your glory to visit me in this dark and dreary place. You ate the coarse food that I ate. You brought gladness to my heart. Now to other people, you might have given rich gifts. To me, you've given yourself. And the point, of course, is this. In Jesus, 
God has gone above and beyond to have fellowship with us, even to the point of becoming human. Speaking to the disciples leading up to the resurrection, Jesus spoke of the joy that they would experience. But all the promises of joy were linked in with his departure. It's as if he was saying to them, when I've died and when I've left you, somehow it's going to be possible for you to know a joy that's impossible for you to know while I'm here. The reason for this will be that after his crucifixion, after his resurrection and ascension, there will be the gift of the Holy Spirit manifesting the reality of Jesus to his people and through his people. He was going to be closer to them and us than he'd ever been before. You know, there's so much in our world today that brings about sadness, apart from the inevitable bereavement. It seems that the predicament of the world today more than ever before is making thoughtful people more and more depressed. Economics worldwide that continue to drain the resources of the less well-off countries so the third world debt has gone to impossible levels. There's a breakdown of society, of the family here in our own country and abroad. And you've only got to look at your TV screen to see the wickedness of ethnic cleansing, of social isolation and the terrible grip of loneliness that seems to hold on to so many. To see the rampant violence and the ever-increasing sexual promiscuity. All of this just increases the weight of misery in our world. The answer to all of this is the transformation, which, as Paul Tomlin says, uh, Graham Tomlin says, involves a new framework for understanding the world and ourselves as the rightful property of God. It involves the establishment of new habits, new patterns of life, new approaches to people and to circumstances. It means living as if all the Christian theology says is true that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, that he is risen from the dead, and therefore death is ultimately a broken, defeated enemy no longer to be feared. It means living as if Christ has died for my sins, and therefore even though I continue to commit sins, ultimately they're dealt with and I need not be covered in shame. It means treating each person I meet as someone created in the likeness of God, precious and with dignity, with the potential of sharing God's nature again. It means living as if this reality is, is a world graced with God's goodness, a world to be celebrated, protected and preserved as God's possession and gift. It means living as if I am loved unconditionally, warmly, constantly and totally. Now, because there is no transformation, the fastest growing industry is that which promotes escapism, However, increasing manic obsession with sport and leisure, with the superficiality of game shows on TV, a preoccupation with the occult, with its tarot readings and, and the like that want to see into the future. Anything that will occupy our minds and take us away from the reality of a world that causes or threatens to cause us pain or affect our happiness in some way. The message of that first Easter and the continuing message for us and future generation is that because Jesus is raised from the dead, because death has been defeated, because the penalty of sin has been paid, our need to escape down the dead end streets and the, and the world and, and Satan have provided for us in the spiritual realms are throwing at us. They can all be dispensed with and we can experience hope in our hearts and a sure future in the presence of God. Mary Magdalene was experiencing a mixture of emotions, and in her mind, she must have been reflecting on all that Jesus had done for her. From the moment he delivered her from the bondage of seven demons, remembering his words, how good it had been to be around him. There was a, a sense of security, all she'd ever wanted was just to be near him, and now it was all gone. Her life was Jesus. Now he was gone, she felt that it, life itself had ended. Her thoughts and her emotions were clouded by all that had been, and all that was to be was just so out of her mind and so far from her wildest imaginations. But she had missed the point. Things had changed so much that she could never go back to the bondage of the life that she'd been delivered from. Maybe that was the real source of fear that she experienced in her isolation. Poor Mary was so desperate to be with her Lord Jesus, even in his death, 
It's an emotional plea when she asks who she thinks is the gardener, where have you laid him? Now imagine the joy. Imagine the, the devastating relief after all that she's seen. She's seen his arrest, his trial, the agony on the way to Calvary, and then the ultimate humiliation of his naked body nailed to a cross. Knowing he was dead, she wanted to say all the things that one forgets to say. And not one of us would have reacted any differently than she did by throwing ourselves at Jesus' feet. Overtaken by the event, she ran to tell the disciples, but the best is yet to be. Her only option, and theirs, was to believe. So there's surprise when you least expect it. And secondly, transformation is the promise of God. Look at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Despite Mary's testimony, the disciples are hiding. They're afraid of what might happen to them if they're identified as Jesus' followers. All that they had dreamt of and hoped for had just disappeared like a vapour. And in the midst of the, the nervous silence and the anxious words in regard to the next step, well, well, do we carry on? Is there safety in numbers? Do we split up and take our chances? Their concerns for themselves, they really outweigh any thought of passing on the things that they've been taught. But that was exactly what needed to be done. But they couldn't do it, not alone. And then Jesus appears to them and he gives peace instead of fear and he gives power instead of weakness. There is comfort, but there's a commission too, and he's given them confidence to fulfill the task. Now, I want you to realise this is not wet nursing here. These men were absolutely paralysed by fear. But by the time the conversation had finished, they knew that in the power of God, they were going to be used to transform the world. Look at verse 21. Again, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Breathing on them to symbolise that they were not alone, but that they would receive God's Spirit to give them strength. Now, within a few weeks, these same men were preaching with such courage that Thousands of people became Christians. And the same men were singing in prison and praying for their persecutors, even when they were being stoned to death. And it was because they were so consumed with the fact that Jesus is alive and by his spirit living in them, they were motivated and inspired. They told the authorities that it was impossible for them to keep quiet because Jesus has been raised from the dead by the power of God and his promise to them held true. Now, we have the advantage of hindsight, of course. But the trouble is we lose sight of who Jesus really is. And it's unfortunate that the transformation that took place in our lives way back in that moment when we trusted Jesus is now only a, a pale imitation of what it used to be. Wasn't it Graham Tomlin says, what started with real energy and exciting new life has ended up with just a few changed habits. Going to church instead of mowing the lawn on a Sunday morning. A new set of friends, not swearing as much, and that's about it. When the disciples realised that Jesus was alive, their fears were kicked into touch. And even though they didn't know exactly what was going to happen next, they knew they were on the brink of something big. Now today is no different. We have no clue as to the plans of God for our long-term future. But we can be sure of this. There is no limit to what God can do because Jesus is risen from the dead. Think about it. Every blessing. Our oh, thanks to uh, Pastor Bob. That's the last time I'll say that as Bob and Mary are moving on to the Cambridge area come May. So we wish them God's blessing and guidance in their new work together. My thanks also to Ian and all the other contributors in word and music. And so we come to our fellowship prayers. And before that, just enjoy this instrumental version of O Sacred Head, 
once wounded. And so to our fellowship prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, for the victory you have won over sin and death and the victories you continue to win in our daily lives, receive our praise and thanks. We bring before you those in our hearts and I'm going to leave some space for you to uh, each fill in uh, individuals that uh, you're particularly thinking about. So Lord, we pray for those many people who are still suffering from COVID. We pray that you'd give them healing. We pray for those with long-term health issues. Help them in their suffering. We remember those who are grieving. Give them your comfort. We pray, Lord, for the lonely. We ask that you may give them your presence and friendship. We pray for those known to us, Lord, who have big decisions to make. We ask you would guide their path. We pray for those who are anxious and worry. Keep them trusting in you. We want to pray for our families, Lord, near and far. Keep us all connected to each other and to you. And so, Lord, we pray for Bob and Mary as they pack up and spend their last week here in Beaconloff. We just ask that you would bless them as they continue to serve. Thank you for your listening ear, your compassionate heart and your constant support because we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I hope you felt the joy of this special Easter day and our final hymn kind of uh, sums it up and it's from the Ottawa Citadel uh, of the Salvation Army. See, what a morning. Closing prayer. Lord, yours is the victory, ours is the hope. Yours is the triumph, ours is the joy. Yours is the glory, ours is the peace. Yours is the power, and ours is the trust. Lord, may your risen presence hold us, guide us, and lead us now and always. Amen. We've spoken of this before, but it's just as a bit of a reminder of a hymn that we can unite in singing for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. So from one unique King's celebrations to the marking of another rather special Queen. Rise up and serve. Till the next time, take care and happy Easter. In this glorious year of the Jubilee We give thanks for Her Majesty In honour of the faithful hearts Who chose to serve and to play her parts Many nations have gathered here from the mountain heights let the song ring clear Celebrating the answered call Blessed with prayer and sacred oil Rise up and serve Is the call we hear With hope in our hearts Joining as one, making
making history Let that best out Through this jubilee Rise up and serve Thanking God for her majesty May God's good grace be upon her now To complete the task and fulfill her vow May the trust in Christ she has held so long Be the truth that burns brightly on Rise up and serve Here's the call we hear With hope in our hearts Joining as one Making history Let fanfare sound Through this jubilee Rise up and serve Thanking God for her majesty On many tongues, one song From east to west Let's keep it burning on One rise up, come on and rise up In this year of jubilee Rise up, come on and rise up Celebration time is here Jubilee is coming Everyone is singing Rise up and greet the dawn The Jubilee is coming Everyone is singing Let's keep it burning Keep it burning on Rise up and serve is the call we hear With hope in our hearts Joining as one Making history Let's 